the lecture for Chapter 9, The Cell Cycle and Cellular Reproduction. Cellular reproduction or cell division can have different functions in different types of organisms. In unicellular organisms, the main purpose of cell division is to create new individuals. So when one unicellular organism goes through cell division, it is going to produce two individual organisms. So two individual unicellular organisms. So the main purpose of cellular reproduction, cell division in unicellular organisms is to create individuals. In multicellular organisms, the purpose, one of the purposes of cellular division is also to create new individuals, but there are also other functions to cellular reproduction. Another function is differentiation. So as an individual is developing, the original cell divides, creating more cells, and then those cells can differentiate into different types of tissue that give rise to the multicellular organism. The last function of cellular reproduction is tissue repair. So if there is damage to the tissue, like damage to the skin, the neighboring cells are going to go through cell division. Here are cells going through cell division. And those daughter cells are then going to repair or replace the damaged cells. So in a multicellular organism, cellular reproduction is important for generating new individuals, for producing cells that can differentiate, and also tissue repair. There are two different methods by which individual organisms can reproduce, and those two different methods are asexual and sexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction involves one parent cell going through a process of division and generating two daughter cells. And during this process, those daughter cells are going to be genetically identical to the parent cell. That means they will have the same number of chromosomes. So if the parent has 50 chromosomes, then each of the daughter cells will also have 50 chromosomes. And not only do they have the same number of chromosomes, but they can contain exactly the same types of genes. So asexual reproduction is going to produce two genetically identical daughter cells, and we refer to them as clones. And this is a common way for unicellular organisms to reproduce. So often when unicellular organisms like bacteria or amoebas reproduce, they're reproducing asexually and the two daughter cells are genetically identical to the parent. The other type of reproduction that organisms can have is sexual reproduction. And sexual reproduction involves two parents producing one offspring. So this is a very different process. And in this process, uh, the parents, in this case humans, have 46 chromosomes. Those individuals, those two parents, are going to produce gametes, and these are the gametes, so the egg and the sperm. And those gametes have only half the complement of normal human chromosomes. So eggs will have 23 chromosomes, sperm will have 23 chromosomes, and then those two gametes, come together, so in fertilization, and that creates one cell that has a normal complement of human chromosomes, 46 chromosomes. And then that one cell divides to form the new individual. So this is an example of sexual reproduction. And sexual reproduction involves two different parents to produce one individual. And then because of this genetic recombination, this combination of genes from each parent, that new individual is going to have a new set of genes. So that new individual is not a clone of either parent. It is genetically unique. Prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms differ greatly in how they perform cell division. And the first thing I'm going to do is go through prokaryotic cell division, and after that I will talk about eukaryotic cell division. So for prokaryotes, just a review of prokaryotic cell structure. This is an electron micrograph of a prokaryotic cell. And if you remember, prokaryotic cells all have a cell wall. All cells must have a cell membrane. 
They also have cytoplasm, that is the inside, everything that is inside the plasma membrane, which includes the cytosol and ribosomes. Now, the last thing I wanna point out is the nucleoid. The nucleoid is the area where you find the chromosomes. So this lighter staining area, this is the nucleoid. And it is not an organelle, just to remind you, prokaryotic cells do not have organelles. So in that nucleoid, you find the chromosome, and this is a cartoon of a prokaryotic chromosome. If you remember when I talked about chromosomes, prokary prokaryotes have only one chromosome, and it is circular in shape. So you can see that this is a circular piece of DNA, and it's composed of only DNA. So there are no proteins associated with the prokaryotic chromosome. And the last thing to point out is that this chromosome is attached to the membrane at one attachment site. So it's not really free floating in the um, prokaryotic cell. It is attached at one small area that attachment site to the membrane. Binary fission is the type of cell division that occurs in prokaryotic cells. And this is the type of asexual reproduction where one cell, one parent cell, goes through a process to produce two genetically identical daughter cells. So that one parent cell is going to produce two daughter cells that are clones of the original parent. Now in any type of cell division, it's very important to be able to divide the chromosomes or divide the genetic material equally between the two daughter cells. And in prokaryotic cells, they do not have a cytoskeleton. So the way to divide the two chromosomes from each other is for the cell to elongate. So in the process of binary fission, you start out with the one parent cell it has its one chromosome, which is attached at the attachment site to the membrane. When the cell gets ready to divide, first thing it's going to do is copy its chromosome. So now it will have two copies, two genetically identical copies, and each copy is attached to the membrane. So there's the original red chromosome and a exact copy, the purple chromosome. Now, each daughter cell is going to have to have one of those chromosomes, so it's very important for those two copies of the chromosomes to move away from each other. And because a prokaryotic cell does not have a cytoskeleton, the easiest way to do this is the cell elongates. So it elongates that area between the two attachment sites for the chromosome, and so as it elongates, the two copies of the chromosome move apart from each other. And once they are far enough apart, then the cell starts to divide. So then the membrane divides, the cell wall divides, and the two daughter cells pinch off, and you end up with two genetically identical daughter cells, and each daughter cell has one copy of the chromosome. Before describing the process of eukaryotic cell division, it's important to go through the eukaryotic cell cycle. And the eukaryotic cell cycle is a ordered set of stages that every eukaryotic cell goes through. Another way to think about this is this is the life cycle of your typical eukaryotic cell. So for the cell cycle, it is divided into two different phases. First is interphase and the second part is M phase or mitosis. Interphase can be looked at as the normal a function of the cell. This is where the cell is doing its normal job. So if it's a cell in the human body, a muscle cell, uh, it is contracting. If it's a neuron, it's busy receiving signals and sending signals. So that's interphase. M phase is where the cell would divide. Now, depending on the type of tissue that a cell belongs to, the cell might spend most of its life in interphase and only divide once or twice. And this would be an example of a neuron. Most neurons do not reproduce very frequently. So the majority of neurons in your body are in interphase and will remain in interphase. Other cells in your body tend to reproduce quite often. So some of the epithelial cells in your skin they go through mitosis fairly frequently, as do the stem cells in your bone marrow that produce all the red blood cells and white blood cells. 
So for those cells that do reproduce quite frequently, they will spend less time in interphase than cells that reproduce very infrequently. Now with interphase, there are three different stages and those stages are G1, S, and G2. Now I'm going to go through and describe the different phases or stages of the cell cycle in a little bit more detail. And the first one I wanna start with is the G1 phase or the G1 stage. Now G1 occurs right after the M phase, right after cell division. So this is when the cell has finished dividing and it enters into G1. And G stands for gap or growth. And this is where the cell is recovering from that cell division process. And part of that recovery involves increasing in size, so it's going to grow larger, and also increasing the number of organelles it has. So its mitochondria are going to increase in number so it can produce more ATP, and it's also going to produce more ribosomes. So that cell can produce more enzymes, proteins that will be enzymes, and so the cell can metabolize. And the cell is going to have its normal function. So whatever function it has in the tissue, it will be able to perform that function. And in G1, some of those cells are going to progress to G0. And G0 is basically a phase where that cell will not replicate anymore. So often neurons, once they enter G1, they will then progress to G0 because they will not go through cell division anymore. But many cells will stay in G1, and when they're in G1, they're going to receive the signal to replicate. So in G1, they will receive a, a hormone signal or some other signal that will tell them they need to get ready to divide again. And if they get that signal and everything is good, they're going to progress into S phase. Once the cell receives the signal to replicate, it's going to progress from G1 phase to S phase. So the S stage or the S phase. And S stands for synthesis, because during this stage, a exact copy of the chromosomes are going to be synthesized. So you're going to have DNA replication occurring in this stage. And this is a very important stage because each of the potential daughter cells needs to have an exact complete copy of the chromosomes. So those daughter cells will be able to function like the original parent cell. So this is a very important stage. It's very important that the parent cell produce two exact copies of the genome so that the daughter cells will each receive a complete copy. Once the DNA has been successfully copied in S phase, then the cell will progress to G2 phase. In G2 phase, G again stands for gap or growth, this is where the rest of the cell is going to get ready for cell division. So the cell is going to synthesize proteins that are going to be involved in the cell division, especially those microtubule fibers, which will form the spindle, which will serve to separate the two copies of the DNA. So G2 phase or G2 stage is where the rest of the cell prepares for cell division. If the cell was able to successfully copy its DNA during S phase, and then it was able to prepare the rest of the cell for cell division during G2 phase, then it's gonna progress to M phase. And M phase is composed of two parts. It's composed of mitosis and cytokinesis. And mitosis has several different stages, prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And the whole purpose of mitosis is to separate those two copies of the chromosomes from each other. And once the two sets of chromosomes are separated, then the cell will progress to cytokinesis. And cytokinesis is where the rest of the cell will divide. And at the end of cytokinesis, you end up with two daughter cells, and those cells will now go into G1 phase. Control of the cell cycle is essential for multicellular organisms. 
It is extremely important that the cells are able to coordinate their behavior and the reproduction in order to facilitate development and repair of tissues. And if there is any abnormal cell cycling in a tissue, that can often lead to disease. And probably the most common disease that you are most familiar with is cancer. And a basic definition of cancer is when the cells are dividing uncontrollably. So they've lost control of their cell cycle. Now in eukaryotic cells, there are several different cell cycle checkpoints. And these are checkpoints that the cell has to pass in order to progress through cell division. So the first checkpoint is the G1 checkpoint. And this is the main checkpoint. And it's basically making sure that the cell is healthy enough to divide. So when the cell gets the signal to divide, and that signal could be one of two things. It could be a growth factor. A growth factor is a signal molecule like a hormone which will bind to receptors at, on the membrane of the cell and send a signal into the cell to tell it to divide. There are also other molecules called cyclins. Cyclins, and these are proteins. It ends in IN, so this is a protein. And these are internal growth factors or signal molecules that will tell the cell to progress to the next stage. Now this G1 checkpoint, basically it's going to check two things. It's basically going to check if the DNA is undamaged, so if the DNA is healthy, and also if there are sufficient nutrients available. So that's the G1 checkpoint. So if the cell has undamaged DNA and if there are enough nutrients, then the cell will progress to S phase. And sometimes these signal molecules, the cyclins or the growth factors are able to take a cell that's in G0 and have it progress to interphase or to S phase. All right, the next checkpoint is after S phase and that is the G2 phase. And the G2 checkpoint, basically the main thing that has to occur is that the DNA has to be replicated properly. So this is after S phase, and the G2 checkpoint is making sure that now the cell has two correct copies of the chromosomes so that each daughter cell will have the complete genetic material. If the DNA is damaged and cannot be repaired, or if it's unable to replicate the DNA, then the cell will go through apoptosis. After the G2 checkpoint, the next checkpoint is the M checkpoint. And the M checkpoint happens when the spindle is attaching to the chromosomes. So this is the checkpoint that makes sure that the spindle fibers are able to attach correctly to the chromosomes because that will allow the chromosomes to separate and be separated for the two daughter cells. So these are the three main checkpoints. G1, make sure the cell has undamaged DNA and it has enough nutrients in order to progress to cell division. G2, make sure that the DNA was correctly copied. And M checkpoint, make sure that the spindle is correctly formed so that the two copies of the DNA can be separated from each other. If all of these checkpoints pass, then the cell will complete cell division. This is a more detailed diagram of the cell cycle checkpoints. And I wanna show this to you because I just want to emphasize how important it is to really control the cell cycle, especially in a multicellular organism. So in this diagram, here is the G1 checkpoint, here is the G2 checkpoint, and this is the M checkpoint. And as I mentioned before, uh, some of the things that can signal or trigger a cell cycle would be growth factors, which are outside of the cell, but also cyclins. So here is cyclin A, here also is cyclin A, cyclin B, cyclin C, D, and E. So there are lots of different cyclins that are involved at different points in the cell cycle. Other thing I wanna point out 
is that DNA damage is really important for facilitating passing that G1 checkpoint. And also DNA damage is also important for that G2 checkpoint. So again, it is so essential that each daughter cell have a correct and complete set of the genome, all the chromosomes that it needs so that those daughter cells can function just like the parent cell. And the last thing I want to point out is that if something goes wrong, if that DNA damage is too great and the cell cannot progress through the cell cycle, then often apoptosis occurs. And apoptosis is cell suicide. Last thing I want to point out are a couple of proteins that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. And one is P53 and the other one is RB. One of the important proteins related to the cell cycle is P53, and the name relates to P is protein and 53 is the molecular weight. So the name doesn't really tell you what it does. But this is a protein that is involved in repairing DNA damage. So if there is no DNA damage, there's no need for the protein and the protein will break down. But if there is DNA damage, then the protein will be phosphorylated. So a phosphate will be added to the protein. And I've talked about that before with ATP, how ATP facilitates work in a cell. That third phosphate is used to, is added to a protein. It phosphorylates the protein, changes the shape, so now it's functional. So if there is DNA damage, the P53 will be phosphorylated, and then the P53 will go interact with the DNA and try to repair the damage. Now the trigger is if too much P53 is phosphorylated, then that indicates there's a lot of damage to the DNA and that the cell should not replicate. So if there's extensive DNA damage, the cell is not in a position to replicate, and then too much P53 will trigger apoptosis. Too much phosphorylated P53 will trigger apoptosis. Since I mentioned apoptosis, I just want to describe it in a little bit more detail. Apoptosis can be described as programmed cell death, and sometimes it's referred to as cell suicide, because what happens is that a cell will get a signal, and then it looks like it causes its own death. And this is a very, very important process, especially in multicellular organisms, because it helps keep the organism, helps keep the tissues balanced and regulated. Now, apoptosis is often triggered in cells that are old and can't function anymore in a particular tissue. It is also triggered in precancerous cells to prevent them from developing into tumors, which will inhibit the function of the tissue. And it can also be triggered in virally infected cells. So cells that are infected with a virus to prevent the spread of infection. Now the way apoptosis actually works is that every cell has a certain set of enzymes called caspases. Cas spaces. And these are enzymes that are found in every cell and normally they are inhibited. But if a cell gets a signal that it needs to die, those caspases become active and that leads to the process of apoptosis. And basically what will happen is you have normal cells that could be what the normal cells look like. They get the signal to go through apoptosis, their caspases become active, and immediately what happens is the cell balls up, it kind of rounds up, and the nucleus collapses. So it doesn't look like a normal nucleus, it kind of condenses, and then it breaks apart into fragments, and then the cell starts to bud off and we use a particular word bleb so blebs it basically sort of blood blubs buds off it blebs and then those fragments of the cell are then phagocytosed by white blood cells and eliminated from the body so when you look at the cells under the microscope you can definitely identify a cell that is going through apoptosis because it has all these blebs all these like budding areas and it's breaking apart into these vesicles. 
RB is another protein that's associated with the cell cycle, and it's very important in regulating the cell cycle. And RB stands for retinoblastoma because when it is mutated and not functioning normally, it can lead to that type of cancer. So the normal function of RB, RB is a protein that binds to E2F. And when it is not activated, so CDK is a cyclin-dependent kinase. Cyclin, remember the cyclins are proteins involved in regulating the cell cycle. So when the cyclin-dependent kinase is not present, the RB remains attached to the E2F. And that prevents the cell cycle from occurring. But if the cell cycle-dependent kinase is present, then that kinase is going to phosphorylate correlate the RB protein. So again, remember that's activating a protein when you phosphorylate a protein. It often activates it by changing its shape. And so now because the RB protein has changed shape, it releases the E2F. So it no longer binds to the E2F. And that E2F then interacts with the DNA and activates genes to produce cell cycle proteins. So when the E2F interacts with the DNA, that leads to progression of the cell cycle. So far, I've gone through a basic explanation of the overall cell cycle. So interphase, which is composed of G1, S, and G2 phase. And now I'm getting ready to go through M phase, which involves mitosis and cytokinesis. But before I actually talk about M phase, I want to go through a reminder about eukaryotic chromosomes. And the first thing about eukaryotic chromosomes is that eukaryotic organisms have multiple linear chromosomes. So remember with the prokaryotes, each prokaryotic cell has only one circular chromosome. Eukaryotes have multiple linear chromosomes. And so I'm just showing you this figure just so that you know that different eukaryotic organisms have different numbers of chromosomes. So for yeast, they have 32. Uh, some plants, you have a lot of variety. Peas only have 14. And this uh, fern has 1,320. And then animals, of course, you have a lot of variety too. Fruit flies have only eight, humans have 46, and goldfish actually have 94. So that's actually one of the definitions or one of the ways to identify different species is by the different number of chromosomes that their cells have. Every human cell has 46 individual chromosomes. And if you were to take those individual chromosomes and lay them end to end, they would measure about six Feet. So each of your cells has six feet worth of DNA. And, it, and most of that DNA needs to be open to the proteins so proteins can come in and express the genes. So make the protein products for those genes. So if you were to look at the nucleus, it might look something like that with all those long strands of DNA open, sort of unwound, so that they could be expressed, the genes can be expressed. Now, when a cell goes through S phase, it got the signal to replicate, it goes through S phase, it's going to duplicate all of those chromosomes. And then after duplicating the chromosomes, then the cell needs to be able to divide the two copies of the chromosome for the daughter cells. So if all of that DNA was unwound, it would be a very difficult task to separate the two copies of the chromosomes. So to make this process easier, those chromosomes can go through condensation. They can be condensed, they can be wrapped up. So it would look maybe something like this to make it easier to separate the copies of the chromosomes. So that's what we call chromosome condensation. When the DNA goes from uncondensed form to a condensed form, and it makes it much easier to move those chromosomes from one side of the cell to the other. This diagram shows the different levels of chromosome condensation that you see in eukaryotic cells or eukaryotic chromosomes. And it starts with the most basic level with the DNA. So this is the DNA, the double helix. 
And in eukaryotic cells, the DNA is wrapped around proteins called histones. And so having that DNA wrapped around for histones forms a structure called a nucleosome. And then that string of nucleosomes can be further condensed into euchromatin. And that euchromatin can then be condensed into a structure called heterochromatin. So that's the normal level of condensation that you see in an interphase cell. When a cell goes through mitosis, it wants to further condense the DNA so it's easier to move. And so what you will see is this DNA will be further condensed and this side is one chromosome and this is the identical copy of that chromosome. And together they're held together here by a centromere and together this is considered a metaphase chromosome. So this is the most highly condensed version of DNA that you find in eukaryotes. Euchromatin and heterochromatin are both found in interphase cells. So if you were to look at the nucleus of a cell that is in interphase, you will see both euchromatin and heterochromatin. And the difference between the two is that heterochromatin is more highly condensed. So that DNA that's wrapped around the histones all of that is wrapped more tightly together. The euchromatin is more loosely held together. So you still have the DNA wrapped around the histones, but the overall structure is more loose. And this is very important for gene expression. So on the DNA, you will find segments of the DNA that are genes, and the genes encode the information to make various types of proteins. And a lot of those proteins actually function as enzymes. So the euchromatin is more loosely assembled so that these genes can be expressed and the proteins can be produced. Heterochromatin, on the other hand, is more tightly condensed. And so those proteins that need to be expressed from the DNA cannot be expressed. So the DNA is not open for gene expression. So in an interface cell, you have to have euchromatin, which allows the genes to be expressed. And if the DNA is in the form of heterochromatin, then you will have no gene expression. When talking about eukaryotic chromosomes, there are two terms that often come up, and those terms are haploid and diploid. And these terms refer to the number of chromosomes you find in the cell. And haploid means that you have only one copy of each type of chromosome. Diploid, diplo means two, you have two copies of each type of chromosome. And as a reference, I'm going to use human cells. Remember I told you human cells have 46 total chromosomes. Another way to indicate this is that there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. So pairs, that means there are two, two of 23, two times 23 equals 46. So that's two different ways to refer to the same number. So in this example for the haploid, it shows three non-homologous chromosomes. Non-homologous chromosomes, homo means the same. So these are not the same. And in here they give different colors. So you have short pink ones, medium sized blue ones, and large green ones. So they're non-homologous, they're not the same. In humans, you have 23 different types of non-homologous chromosomes. So in this example, it's only showing three. You can pretend that in a human cell, you would have 23 different types of chromosomes. So those are non-homologous chromosomes. Now, most of our cells are diploid cells. So that means that we have two copies of each type of chromosome. So in this example, there are two of these pink type, short pink type chromosomes. And there would be two of these medium sized blue chromosomes and two of these large green chromosomes. And when you have a pair of chromosomes that are similar in structure, and that also means they carry similar genes, they are called homologous chromosomes. So it's a pair of homologous chromosomes. So this is one pair of homologous chromosomes. And in this example, there are three of them. 
So one, two, three. And just to point out that, again, in most of your cells, they are diploid. You have two copies of each chromosome, and you got a copy of each chromosome from your mother and a copy from your father. So, for example, this darker purplish chromosome could have come from your mother, and the pink one came from your father. Darker blue came from your mother, a lighter blue came from your father, and this came from your mother, and this came from your father. So half of your DNA or one set of your chromosomes came from your mother and one set came from your father. And so that's why we refer to them as 23 pairs because you got a set from your mother and a set from your father. So in terms of mitosis, we are only talking about diploid cells. So when we're referring to the cells that go through mitosis, those are diploid cells. In the next chapter, when I talk about meiosis, then the haploid cells come into play. This figure is called a karyotype, and a karyotype shows all the chromosomes that are present in a particular cell. And this is an example of a human karyotype. So these are the typical chromosomes that you would find in a human cell. And as I mentioned before, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes in each human cell. And what you can see here is that most of the chromosomes are numbered. So you have chromosome number one, two, three, and so on, all the way down to 22 down here. So that's 22 of the 23 pairs. The last pair of chromosomes are called the sex chromosomes, and this determines the sex of the individual. And you have two basic options, XX. Uh, if an individual has two X chromosomes, they will be female. If an individual has an X and a Y, they will be male. So that's the 23rd set of chromosomes. And like I said, they are referred to as the sex chromosomes. Now notice for these 22, 23 pairs, you have two homologous chromosomes. So this was a chromosome you got from one parent and you got another chromosome that has the same shape and carries the same general types of genes as the first one. So they're homologous pairs of chromosomes. And one came from your mother and one came from your father. And that's true for all the chromosomes. If you look through all of them, there are two of every type of chromosome. And then you also have two sex chromosomes. You'll either have an X and an X or an X and a Y. This diagram compares what chromosomes look like before DNA replication and after DNA replication. So this part of the figure, this shows one chromosome. This is one chromatid. So this is an original chromosome and this area here will be the centromere. And so this is in the condensed form. Once DNA replication occurs, this one chromosome will be duplicated and this shows the original chromosome and its identical copy. And they are held together at the centromere. So this is the original chromosome. This is the du duplicated chromosome. And the terms we use to refer to this is that one strand of DNA is called a chromatid. So that's a chromatid. And when you have two identical chromatids held together by the centromere, they are called sister chromatids. And technically, when you are counting chromosomes, you count centromeres. So in this figure, this is one chromosome. This is also one chromosome, but it's one chromosome that is composed of two sister chromatids. So now back to the cell cycle. So if you remember in interphase, a cell would have received the signal to divide during G1. And if it passed the G1 checkpoint, the cell would have progressed to S phase. And in S phase, it would have duplicated its DNA. And if it correctly duplicated its DNA, it would have passed the G2 checkpoint. And the rest of the cell would have increased in size, duplicated its organelles in order to get ready to divide. So now if it passed G2, now the cell is going to enter into mitosis. And mitosis essentially is a series of four stages, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. 
And these four stages basically separate the two sets of chromosomes from each other. So the two copies of chromosomes separates them to opposite sides of the cell, and then the cell will able, be able to divide. So in this diagram, this part of the diagram is focusing on prophase. And this further subdivides prophase into three stages, early prophase, prophase, and prometaphase. Now, for me, you can just uh, consider this all prophase because it's a progression. So this is a progression of things that are occurring and it's kind of arbitrary to just divide them into early prophase, prophase, and prometaphase. But you should know what is occurring during prophase in general. So the first thing that will really occur in prophase is the nucleolus is going to start to disappear. And if you remember, the nucleolus is the area, darker staining area inside the nucleus where the rRNA is being produced. And the rRNA is needed for the structure of ribosomes, and ribosomes are needed to produce proteins, which is part of gene expression. So the fact that the nucleolus is disappearing means that the cell is not going to be expressing its genes. So it's turning off gene expression for the duration of mitosis. So it's going to stop producing the RNA because it's going to stop expressing genes. So that's the first thing that you'll see is that the nucleolus is going to start to disappear. The next thing you're going to see is that the nuclear envelope is going to start breaking down. So the nuclear envelope contains the DNA in the nucleus and you want to break down that envelope so you have room to separate the two copies of the chromosome. So the nuclear envelope is going to break down. The other thing you're going to see is that the chromatin is going to start to condense because remember, normally it's unwound. It's in euchromatin form because it was being expressed. The genes were being expressed. But now because you're stopping gene expression, you can condense the chromatin, which will make it a lot easier to separate the two copies of the chromosome. Last thing you're going to see is that the centrosomes are going to be duplicated. So the centrosomes are composed of two centrioles, and these are going to be the microtubule organizing centers. And so the centrosomes have been duplicated. So you have two centrioles here, two centrioles there, and it's going to start, those structures are going to start forming the spindle fibers. And those spindle fibers are the little fibers that are coming out of those uh, centrosomes. And that struct structure is called an aster. So an aster is like a star. So it has sort of the little star look to it. All right, so that's basically what is happening during prophase. So as you progress from early prophase to prometaphase, so nuclear envelope is breaking down, nucleolus disappears, nuclear envelope is breaking down. So by, by the end of prophase and this prometaphase, there's no nuclear envelope. The DNA is beginning to condense, so it's getting more and more condensed as you progress until you have the classic uh, condensed chromosomes made of two sister chromatids. Also, you have the asters were forming and they migrate to opposite sides. So you can see the asters are migrating to opposite sides. And so at the end of prophase, those asters will be on opposite sides and the spindle fibers are connecting to the chromosomes. At the end of prophase, when the chromosomes are fully condensed, this is what they would look like. And that is an electron micrograph showing a chromosome. And just to go over the anatomy of a chromosome, the chromosome is composed of chromatids. This is one chromatid, and it could be the original chromosome. And remember that original chromosome was duplicated during S phase and interphase, and that is the identical copy. And because these are two identical copies, they are called sister chromatids. So they contain exactly the same sequence of DNA. They have exactly the same genes. And they are held together by the centromere. So the centromere, they are physically held together. And when you are counting chromosomes, you count centromeres. So this whole structure is considered one chromosome. So it's one chromosome that is composed of two sister chromatids. 
Now, the other thing I want to point out is that there is a protein structure on the side of each sister chromatid, and that is called a kinetochore. And the kinetochore, that is where the microtubules of the spindle fibers will attach. So the microtubules are going to attach to the kinetochores, and those microtubules are going to pull the two sister chromatids apart. Just a review of what is happening during prophase. Again, this is a progression from early prophase through prophase to prometaphase. And the first thing you would notice is that the nucleolus is disappearing. So the nucleolus, especially in this picture, you can actually see it. It's that darker staining area that's in the nucleus. So that will disappear because gene expression is being put on hold. Next thing you'll notice is the nuclear envelope is going to start breaking down. So in early prophase, you might still be able to see that nice clear division of the edge or the border of the nucleus. But in later stages of prophase, you're not going to see that anymore. So it's broken down. You'll also notice that the chromatin is condensing. So in early stages, you might see that it's starting to get dark and then you will see it in later stages where it looks like very solid colored bodies. And the last thing you're going to see is aster formation. In aster formation, those cent centrosomes are really only found in animal cells. So that aster formation you'll see here, it's a center area and you have those microtubules, those spindle fibers radiating out from it. And as prophase, prophase progresses, you'll see an aster on each side of the cell. So that's essentially what is happening during prophase. And what you cannot see in the pictures is that the microtubules are attaching to the kinetochores of the sister chromatids for each chromosome. After prophase, the next stage is metaphase. And metaphase involves those chromosomes lining up along a metaphase plate. And so remember, each chromosome is con or consists of two sister chromatids. And so all those chromosomes line up in roughly a straight line, equidistant between the centrosomes in animal cells. And those centrosomes have microtubules that are attached to the kinetic cores of each sister chromatid of each chromosome. And so that's metaphase. And remember, there is a metaphase checkpoint. So as long as all the chromosomes are correctly attached to the microtubules, the spindle fibers, and they line up correctly along the metaphase plate, then mitosis will continue. The next stage after metaphase is anaphase. And anaphase is when those two sets or those sister chromatids are pulled apart. So what will happen is that the centromere will split, the centromere that is holding the two sister chromatids will split, and then those two sister chromatids will be pulled apart by the uh, spindle fibers. And the spindle fibers, there will be two types of movement. So the kinetic core spindle fibers, the kinetic core spindle fibers that are attached to the kinetic cores, they're going to shorten. So they're going to break down and the, they will become shorter and they will pull the sister chromatids to opposite sides. There are other types of spindle fibers called polar spindle fibers and the polar spindle fibers go across the cell, and those will actually slide past each other, pushing the ends of the cell away from each other. So the cell is actually going to elongate. So those polar spindle fibers are going to push the cell longer. So it's almost as if you were fishing and you're reeling in a fish, so the fishing line is getting shorter, bringing the fish towards you. And in addition, you are walking backwards. So two types of movement to separate the two copies of chromosomes from each other. The last stage is telophase. And telophase is basically the opposite of prophase. 
So everything that is happening in telophase is the reverse of what happened in prophase. So what will happen is the spindle fibers will start to break down. Spindle fibers are going to break down. The DNA is going to uncondense, so it's going to unwind. The nuclear envelope is going to reform, and you're going to start to see the presence of the nucleolus again. And again, the nucleolus, that's where the rRNA is being made. That indicates that gene expression is beginning again. So in telophase, it's the opposite of prophase. Spindle fibers are breaking down. Chromosomes are uncondensing. Nuclear envelope is reforming. Nucleolus, you can begin to see that again. And of course, that's happening on both sides. So that's happening with the DNA on the other side. Nuclear envelope is reforming. Spindle fibers are breaking down. Chromosome is un chromosomes are uncondensing and the nucleolus is visible again. Mitosis is the process of separating the copies of chromosomes from each other, physically moving them to opposite ends of the cell. Cytokinesis occurs after mitosis, and cytokinesis is the process by which the rest of the cell separates from each other, forming two daughter cells. And cytokinesis is different in animal cells and plant cells. So this is a diagram of how cytokinesis occurs in animal cells. And the first thing that happens is that you can see a cleavage furrow. And the cleavage furrow occurs along the metaphase plate. So during metaphase, this was one cell, and those chromosomes lined up along the metaphase plate. So this was the metaphase plate in this particular cell. So when cytokinesis is occurring, that cleavage furrow, kind of a pinching in, that's going to result in the division of the cell, that will occur along the metaphase plate. So for that cleavage furrow to occur, basically what is happening is a contractile ring is forming. So actin fibers that are around the area, they are contracting and basically pinching off along that metaphase plate. So it's going to pinch off along that metaphase plate and produce two independent cells. Cytokinesis is a different process in plant cells because plant cells have a rigid cell wall. And because the plant cells have that rigid cell wall, they can't use a cleavage furrow or a contractile ring to pinch off cells from each other. So what they basically have to do is they have to build a new cell wall between uh, the two reforming nuclei. And the way they build the cell wall is by transporting vesicles that contain membrane and cell wall components to form that cell plate. And so what will basically happen is if you have the original cell, it goes through mitosis, it's in telophase, so it's reforming a nucleus on one side, reforming a nucleus on the other side. And what will happen is these vesicles will transport to the metaphase plate and start building a cell wall. And it begins kind of in the middle, and eventually it progresses until you have a cell wall built between the two new nuclei, and now you have two daughter cells. This figure shows actual photos of cells in different stages of the cell cycle. And the top row shows animal cells. These are white fish cells, and the bottom row are plant cells. I'm just going to go through these pictures and point out some features that you would be able to see under the microscope at the different stages of the cell cycle. So the first stage here for the animal cells, this is interphase. This is what a normal cell would look like. So you can see a nice intact nuclear membrane. So there's a nice uh, distinction between the nucleus and the rest of the cell. And inside the nucleus, you see sort of a uniform color because the DNA is uncondensed. It's in the form of euchromatin, a lot of euchromatin because you're getting gene expression. And there's also some heterochromatin for the DNA that is not being expressed. And it looks like here, this is a nucleolus, so a darker staining area, indicating also there's gene expression. So once the cell gets the signal 
to divide and it passes all the checkpoints, then it will progress to prophase. And in prophase, you no longer see the nucleolus. You don't see the nuclear envelope anymore. You don't have that nice delineation between the nucleus and the rest of the cell. And also the DNA seems to be condensing. So you see darker strands of that DNA because it's condensing to the level of metaphase chromosome cond condensation. And I don't really see the asters here, but you should be able to see aster formation. So that's the centrosomes moving to opposite sides of the cell. Then in metaphase, the main key to metaphase is you see those chromosomes lining up in pretty much a straight line along the center of the cell. And here you can see the asters, two asters on either side. And you should also be able to see the spindle fibers attaching or attaching to those chromosomes along the metaphase plate. Anaphase is when those that line of chromosomes separates. So often what you will see are two basic lines of chromosomes because the sister chromatids are being pulled apart and you are able to see some of those polar spindle fibers between the two sets of chromosomes and also you can see spindle fibers between the aster and the two lines of sister chromatids. Telophase, telophase you're going to start to see the opposite of prophase. So the DNA is going to start to unwind, uncondense. You might see nuclear envelope brief formation and you'll see the asters or the spindle fibers breaking down. All right, so that's telophase. And at the end of the telophase, you're going to have cytokinesis. And so you'll get that pinching off. So you might see the cell membrane sort of pinching off along that metaphase plate. For the plant cells, you're going to see a lot of the same things with the DNA. So here's an interface cell and here are the, nucleo the nucleolus. And then you have in prophase, you can see the nuclear envelope is breaking down. There's no nucleolus and the DNA is starting to condense. Here metaphase, it's lined up roughly in a straight line. And then anaphase, you can see those sister chromatids are being pulled apart. And you can see spindle fibers between the sister chromatids and telophase, the nuclear envelope is reforming on those two new nuclei. The DNA is unwinding, you see a more uniform color, and eventually you'll be able to see a nucleolus. And after telophase, you get cytokinesis. Here you can see the cell plate is beginning to form. So that straight line across here, that's the cell plate, and eventually it will be built all the way across, and now you will have your two new plant cells. Most of the cells in the human body are called somatic cells. And somatic cells are in G0. And if you remember from the cell cycle, G0 cells are cells that are not dividing. So the vast majority of the cells in your body are not going through cell division. But there are a few cells that do retain the ability to divide, and those are often referred to as stem cells. And when we talk about stem cells, there are two basic types. There are embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells. And I wanna just talk about the differences between the two. So embryonic stem cells have to do with the development of an embryo. So basic human reproduction, we all started out as a fertilized egg. So that was an individual cell. And then as that cell went through mitosis, as it went through mitosis, eventually all those cells differentiated and gave rise to the multicellular organism that we are with all our different types of tissues. So embryonic stem cells are arise from that fertilized egg and that fertilized egg is going through mitosis very frequently during uh, embryo embryonic development. So those cells are replicating a lot. They are not spending much time in interphase. And then as those cells divide, then they can differentiate into different types of tissue. And those tissues can give rise to different types of structures. And so during embry embryological development, there is a lot of mitosis going on. 
And again, that gives rise to all the different types of tissue like skin, nerves, bones, muscles, liver, and thyroid. So embryonic stem cells, if you have embryonic stem cells, they reserve the ability to differentiate into any type of tissue. Adult stem cells are also replicating frequently. They do not spend much time in interphase, but they are only able to differentiate into a couple of different types of cells. The example of an adult stem cell is the blood stem cell, the bone marrow stem cell. And these are cells that are found in the bone marrow and they are replicating frequently, again, not spending much time in interphase but all of their daughter cells differentiate into different types of blood cells. So from these bone marrow stem cells, you can produce red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells. So the adult stem cells are more limited in what type of cell they can produce. Embryonic stem cells can produce any type of tissue cell, uh, whereas adult stem cells cannot. Cloning is a process by which scientists can make genetically identical individuals. And there are two types of cloning. First type of cloning is reproductive cloning. And the purpose of re reproductive cloning is to create a genetically identical individual. And to perform this process, they would need cells from the original individual. And because most of the cells in a multicellular organism are G0, they are not replicating. So they need to find a cell that is capable of going through mitosis. And the cell that they find is a fertilized egg. So in this case, if they are going to clone a sheep, which was the first organism that was cloned, they take a fertilized sheep egg and they remove the original nucleus in that fertilized egg. And then what they do is they take a nucleus from a G0 cell from the sheep they wanna clone, and they put that nucleus into the fertilized egg. And remember the nucleus contains all the DNA, that's all the genetic information that will allow that cell to develop into the same type of individual. So they take the nucleus from the G0 cell put it into that fertilized egg that had its original nucleus removed. And now because this is a fertilized egg, it's an embryonic stem cell, it will divide and differentiate and form an individual. And because the DNA is the same as the original organism, they will be clones. The definition of a clone is are genetically identical individuals. The other type of cloning is therapeutic cloning. And this is where the scientists are trying to clone a type of tissue that can be used for a therapy. But the process is basically the same. So you can take G0 cells, somatic cells from an individual who has normal tissue. Again, those G0 cells are not going to replicate. So you need cells that are capable of mitosis. And in this case, it is a fertilized egg. You remove the nucleus from the original nucleus from the fertilized egg, you replace it with the nucleus from the cells that you are interested in, and that will create stem cells. And those embryonic stem cells are capable of dividing and differentiating, and from this you can generate the tissue you need. So hypothetically, you could generate nervous tissue that you could use to replace damaged spinal cords. You could replace uh, and, uh, stem cells, uh, bone marrow stem cells to replace uh, defective cells like for a leukemia, or you could create muscle cells. The most common disease that is associated with the cell cycle is cancer. And I mentioned before that cancer is uncontrolled cell growth. And that's basically what is happening is that cells have lost the ability to regulate their cell cycle. And so the cells are growing uncontrollably. And when the cells grow uncontrollably, they form tumors, masses of cells that do not function correctly in the tissue, and it inhibits the function of the tissue. Now with these cancer cells, when a cell develops, often the cell becomes undifferentiated. 
So usually that is due to a mutation. So you have a tissue here, normal tissue, and for a variety of reasons, a cell in that tissue can develop a mutation, which makes it undifferentiated. So now it can't function in the tissue the way it should. And often what happens, because it's undifferentiated, it starts to divide uncontrollably. And sometimes what you will notice in these cells is that the nuclei look different. They can be enlarged. And also, if you were able to look at the chromosomes, they can have abnormal number of chromosomes, or the chromosomes can be abnormal. So they can have longer sections or shorter sections. So they can have deleted or added portions. And another thing about these cells is that they can no longer go through apoptosis. So that ability to uh, have programmed cell death to remove cells that are not be beneficial to the body, that, that ability is lost. All right, and as the cell divides, these cells start to pile up on top of each other. So normal functioning cells have something called contact inhibition. When they uh, notice that there are other cells nearby, they stop replicating. But when you have certain mutations that occur in a precancerous cell, they no longer have that contact inhibition and they keep multiplying, forming the tumor. And some cells may further mutate to be able to metastasize. And metastasize basically means that they can enter into a blood vessel or a lymphatic vessel and they can spread to another area of the body and start another tumor. And that's called metastasis. Another thing that tumors are often able to do, especially if they are very large, is something called angiogenesis. And they can actually trigger the formation of blood vessel formation in the tumor. So if the tumor is getting very large, they can actually trigger formation of blood vessel formation. So now they can get nutrients to support their growth. The most common cause of cancer is mutation. And a mutation is a change in the sequence of DNA. And most of the mutations affect genes that regulate the cell cycle. Now, in terms of mutation, there are several different causes of mutation. And this figure right here, this box, shows you the different causes of mutation. The first one is heredity. And heredity means that you inherited an already mutated copy of a gene from your parents. And so that's common in like the breast cancer Associated with breast cancer, the BRCA1 gene is a gene you can inherit from your parent, and it will increase your chances of developing breast cancer. There are also mutations that it can occur due to exposure to herbicides and pesticides or other toxins. So some chemicals like that can actually mutate your DNA. And if it mutates a, GNA, a gene that is involved in the cell cycle, that could lead to cancer. Radiation is another source of mutation, and this is a commonly known one. Uh, UV is a type of radiation, and you should be aware of the fact that if you're exposed to too much UV light, you could develop skin cancer. Another cause of mutation are viruses. Some viruses have the ability to splice into your chromosomes and change the sequence of DNA in your chromosome. And one common uh, example of this is HPV. HPV is human papillomavirus, and it is associated with cervical cancer. So these are just some of the examples of things that can trigger changes in the DNA. Now, the two types of genes that can lead to cancer are proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. So these are the two general classifications of genes where if they're mutated, that can often lead to a loss of control of the cell cycle. Now, proto-oncogenes. Proto-oncogenes, proto before onco is cancer. So these are genes that promote the cell cycle. So they trigger the cell cycle to occur. 
So these could be genes that encode a growth factor that would stimulate the cell. So this is an example of a growth factor. This is the growth factor. It interacts with a receptor and that sends a signal into the cell to go through the cell cycle. So a proto-oncogene could be a gene that allows for the production of a growth factor. And if it's mutated, maybe it produces too much growth factor and it overstimulates cells. Another one, another um, proto-oncogene could be for the receptor for the growth factor or molecules in the signaling pathway. So there are many different areas where you could have a proto-oncogene. But the end result is if the proto-oncogene is mutated, it will cause an overstimulation of the cell cycle or mitosis. The other type of a uh, gene that leads to cancer are the tumor suppressor genes. And these are genes that normally stop the cell cycle from occurring. So these are often genes that are involved in the checkpoints. And if those genes are mutated, then the checkpoints no longer function the way they should and it allows for uncontrolled cell growth. When a proto-oncogene is mutated, it can change into an oncogene. And an oncogene is a gene that stimulates the cell cycle. Now, triggering the cell cycle in a cell is a pretty complicated process. Often it involves first a growth factor that will bind to a receptor that will send a signal through a signaling pathway, and that involves several proteins. Then that signal will go down to the DNA. It will uh, trigger gene expression in the DNA, which will promote a protein that is involved in regulating the cell cycle. So that's the normal pathway or the normal way to stimulate the cell cycle. With an oncogene, you will have a mistake in one of those molecules. So an oncogene could possibly, possibly lead to overproduction of growth factors so that these receptors are being overstimulated. Or you could have another mutation that changes the receptor so that the receptor it overstimulates by itself. Or there could be mutations in the proteins involved in the signaling pathway that cause overstimulation, overactivation of the DNA. Either way, if there is a, a mistake in the growth factor, mistake in the receptor, mistake in the signaling pathway, it's going to overexpress genes that are involved in the cell cycle. So you're going to get overproduction of these proteins, maybe overproduction of cyclins, and that's going to lead to overstimulation of the cell cycle, uncontrolled cell growth. The other type of gene that is involved in triggering cancer are tumor suppressor genes. And the normal function of the tumor suppressor gene is to stop cell division. And the normal function would be that there would be an inhibiting growth factor. So an inhibiting factor that would bind to a receptor and that would send a signal to the cell to produce a protein that would stop the cell cycle and that would be the tumor suppressor gene. But if there is a mutation somewhere in this pathway, then instead of producing the normal tumor suppressor protein, an abnormal protein would be produced and it would not be able to stop the cell, cell cycle. And so if the tumor suppressor gene is mutated where it cannot function the way it should, then the cell cannot stop the process of the cell cycle. There are many different ways that DNA can be damaged. And this figure shows you the six different ways that DNA can be damaged. First example is a single strand break. That's where you get a break in one of the sugar phosphate backbones. Another type of uh, damage that can be done to the DNA is a mismatch in the nitrogenous bases. So remember complementary base pairing, adenine binds across from thymine, guanine binds or lines up across from cytosine, and uh, damage could be a mismatch where maybe an adenine is lining up across from a cytosine. 
Also, a nitrogenous space could be damaged. So one of those spaces could be directly damaged. There could be a double strand break. So that means both the sugar phosphate backbones have been broken. There could be an intra-strand intra crosslink. That's where one of the nitrogen bases binds back to its own sugar phosphate backbone. And there could be an interstrand crosslink where one of the nitrogenous bases actually binds directly to the opposite sugar phosphate backbone. So these are the six different ways that DNA can actually be damaged. And in your cells, there are enzymes like the nuclease and the DNA polymerase and DNA ligase, which are involved in repairing any of those types of damage. So nuclease will cut out the damaged area. DNA polymerase will replace it with the correct sequence and DNA ligase will sort of glue it in there. It will form the covalent bond in the sugar phosphate backbone. So our cells do have a method to repair DNA but sometimes that method doesn't always work, especially as we get older. It's harder for the cells to repair damage that is done to the DNA. So that's one of the reasons why cancer is more common in older uh, humans. Telomeres are also associated with limiting cell division. And telomeres are the segment of DNA found at the end, at both ends of a chromosome. And a telomere is a repeated sequence of DNA that you find at either end. Every time a cell replicates, an enzyme called telomerase, telomerase will shorten the telomeres. So when the cell divides, the telomerase will shorten the telomere, basically removing one of those repeated segments. So when those daughter cells replicate, the telomerase will remove the next segment and that will continue on until the telomeres are gone. Once the telomeres are completely gone, then the cells cannot go through cell division again. So this is a way to limit how many times a particular cell can divide. If there is a mutation in the gene that encodes the telomerase, that prevents the breakdown of telomeres, then the cell will have no limits on how many times it can go, to, go through cell division, and that can lead to the development of cancer. This is the end of the lecture for chapter nine on cell cycle and cellular reproduction. The focus was on mitosis, so make sure that you know all the different stages of the cell cycle of mitosis how cytokinesis occurs in plants and animals, and also how the cell cycle relates to cancer.